Welcome to the uh, Senior Physicist Group uh, meeting, talk. Uh, what I'm going to do is uh, ask our uh, planning group <clears throat> personnel to introduce themselves and then anyone else who wants to introduce themselves can. Uh, I'm Don Navani and I'm the chairman of the group. And uh, let's see, my, my background, I'm a retiree from NIST. Uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology. Okay, uh, Flash, you want to go next? Sure. Uh, I'm Howard Gordon, uh, also known as Flash, and uh, I retired from the National Security Agency after 44 years. Rudy? Okay. I'm Rudy Kutar. Uh, I retired from the Naval Research Laboratory a week before before 9-11, and I have since been involved in, in lots of things. I don't know where all the copious free time I was supposed to have when I retired went. And a uh, member of this group, I'm a member of Toastmasters. Uh, I was, uh, uh, I, I was, uh, I'd, uh, I created a, a PhD, uh, not a PhD track, a, a, a course, in quantum computer programming at George Mason University many years ago. And I'm still interested in, and involved in uh, that effort. Next. Okay, Rudy, or not Rudy, uh, Paul. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm Paul Rodriguez. I'm a physicist and uh, retired from the Naval Research Laboratory. Okay, Jerry. Uh, Jerry Stenbachen, uh, retired from National Institute of Standards and Technology. Okay, now, is there anyone else that wants to introduce themselves and, and, and the, their background? And they may join this group if they wish. Yes. <laughs> okay, in, in that case, let me start. I'm going to start with a, a little bit of an introduction about the, uh, the senior physicist group. And uh, let's see if I can. Oh. Let's see if I if I can find my. Uh... Okay, my my, my talk. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, thank, I want to thank you all for attending today's talk, uh, the Senior, Senior Physicist Group, SPG, formerly was the Mid-Atlantic Senior Physicist Group, MASPG, and is sponsored by the American Physical Society. Uh, before the pandemic, our talks were held at one o'clock in the afternoon on, on uh, generally the uh, third Wednesday of the month at the American Center for Physics in College Park. Uh, since the pandemic, uh, we've been holding our talks on the Zoom platform. Our planning meetings are held the first Thursday of the month on Zoom, and now they are being held on a hybrid where they're both in person and uh, on Zoom. Anyone interested can attend. Uh, a link to our past is and you can see this on your screen. Uh, it's at uh, APS.org slash units, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the history uh, and purpose of the group can also be found on the APS.org slash units, et cetera. A uh, little different, et cetera, on this one. Uh, the SPG audience is uh, composed largely of retired physicists, most of whom are PhDs, although anyone interested can attend the talk. The talks are generally at a level of a university colloquium or a Scientific American article. Uh, they are approximately one hour long with no time limit and very informal and in that uh, during the talks, questions are often asked. Uh, the talks are preferably held on the third Wednesday of the month at one o'clock, but they can be scheduled to another day if needed. Uh, we are also looking for speakers and I would encourage you all to volunteer to give us a, a talk sometime. 
To do this, just contact me, Dean Novotny2 at Verizon.net, or actually anyone on the uh, planning committee. Uh, after uh, basic acceptance of your title, uh, we will need uh, what you call it a tag, a title, a short biography, and an abstract. So uh, with that, we can uh, schedule and mail uh, an announcement on the APS website. Before the pandemic uh, and use of Zoom, the speaker was invited to uh, join the planning group uh, before the meeting for a complimentary lunch at a local restaurant. Having the talk and speaker on Zoom does not uh, lend to this, uh, but if the talk happens to be a hybrid and the speaker is at the American Center for Physics, uh, uh, a lunch, lunch invitation will be made. With that, again, I would like to encourage you all to become a member of the planning group. It is this group that makes these talks possible, and we would like to extend an offer to anyone interested in joining. We hold monthly planning meetings on the first Thursday of the month at one o'clock, and they can be attended on Zoom. Uh, we have no meetings uh, or talk in July. We appreciate any input that uh, uh, you might have for the future of this group, and we would like to cater to our members' interests. To join, please con uh, contact, and it's on your screen there, APS uh, units at APS.org and ask to be attended to the, uh, as, as you were, asked to be added to the SPG planning group. Thank you. With you, let me introduce the talk. Uh, the title of the talk today is The Magic of Lasers in Entertainment Behind the Technology. Uh, it was not long after Theodore Maiman published his first demonstration of a ruby laser in August 6th. 1960 issue of Nature that it was realized that such a unique light source could be used in many applications, including entertainment. Today, advanced material science allows the fabrication of laser diodes emitting in the red, blue, and green wavelengths with powers exceeding four watts from a single emitter. Lasers now exhibit, exhibiting 40% efficiency up from the five one hundredths percent of their ancestors. Such increase in efficiency and decrease in sizes have made lasers ubiquitous. It is now possible to use a large number of lasers uh, sources to produce compelling volumetric kinetic displays of laser light. And we'll see some uh, illustrations of that uh, in, in John's talk. John Thule today is our speaker. John is one of the founders and CTO of Image Engineering Incorporated, where he leads a team in the design and manufactures of laser systems for entertainment applications. He developed one of the first 20 watt laser projectors in the US using beam combined laser diode technology. He developed uh, the only FDA approved audience scanning laser projector using spinning polygon mirrors. John holds a PhD in electrical engineering from the University of Maryland, College Park. He joined the NIST's Semiconductor Electronics Division in 1982, where he served as leader of the CMOS and Novel Devices Group until his retirement in January 2016. His research activities included failure to wear out mechanisms of semiconductor devices, radiation uh, effects on microelectronic micro devices, microelectromechanical systems, and nanoelectronic devices. He also served as the laser safety officer at NIST, where he was responsible for establishing safety and inspection protocols for all laser systems in the physical measurement laboratories. With the, that, please welcome John Suley. Thank you, Don. I'm going to share now. <clears throat> uh, okay, so you have to unshare. Okay, there we go. Yeah, I had to find the button. <laughs> okay. All right, let's make sure you see this first. How about that? Okay. Does that look good to everybody? Yes. Okay, yeah. good. 
So anyway, Don, uh, thanks very much for the invitation. Um, indeed, an honor and a pleasure to talk to you guys. In fact, every year I would sponsor, you know, maybe two or three uh, Society for Physics students, and they'd work in my lab all summer, and then we'd go down to College Park, and they would have their final presentation. So something I really look forward to and miss. But um, <clears throat> What I'd like to talk to, now NIST invited me to give a colloquium on this company that I started uh, during my career at NIST. I was at, I was at NIST at 34, for 34 years, and um, I started this company with my brothers. And, you know, it's, it's sort of like something, you know, lasers always fascinated me. And, you know, it, it's always um, toying around with them until I got my first ion laser, a 5.1. Lexcel ion laser from a medical institute somewhere in Los Angeles and purchased that thing in 1988, got it back to my home and realized it needed three-phase power, which you don't have in residential. So we got a rotary phase converter and um, had to do a lot of modifications. And I finally got the thing to laze. And, you know, when you see that turquoise beam come out of the aperture and hit the, the wall in your in your basement you're, you're you're hooked you're addicted so that's sort of like my story here but um <clears throat> but so, so NIST found out I was I was building this company and, and the interesting part of it I didn't do lasers at NIST at all and when I became a you know a manager um, a group leader they you know you have to go to the um to the legal people and explain to them all the stuff you do that's outside of NIST, you know? And of course I said, well, you know, I got this, this laser light show company. And I said, well, we have to make sure that the government is in no way helping you uh, personally with your business. I said, no, 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 it's, it's the other way around, guys. It's like my business is helping the government because, you know, because of what I learned outside of NIST with this company, you know, I built the, one of the first um, laser uh, integrated circuit repair stations at NIST where we use lasers to actually cut the metallizations. We get deposit metallizations and we can cut through, uh, you know, little fine thin layers to actually fix things. And we, we use a lot for MEMS. And of course, I also use my knowledge to become the LSO. So, so, uh, so one thing you know, they, they were on. That's fine. Man. They probably got that. That's fine. So anyway. So anyway, what what this what this presentation is it's 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 an historic it's, it's more or less a historical perspective um, based on my uh, experience at starting this company and I started this company in the uh, middle to late '80s and that's sort of like when you know lasers were first being used for entertainment in a serious way and 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 what's interesting about this historical perspective is that the use of lasers in entertainment came from the source itself. So it came right from the originator and the inventor of the laser, and I'll explain that to you. So anyway, um, here's my company. Um, we're located in Curtis Bay, Maryland. Uh, we have a 60,000 square foot building there. We also have offices in Las Vegas, Nevada, and Los Angeles, California. And uh, we first started uh, doing um, a lot of sports type of teams. We have 16 NFL teams now. So at any time that if you're watching professional football, when the player introductions and when they come out from the, you know, when they first come out and start the um, game, you'll probably see our effects. Uh, we also have a, um, a, a part of our companies in Las Vegas where we service all the, uh, the big tours. Paul McCartney's a client, Lady Gaga, uh, the Trans-Siberian Orchestra is one of our largest clients, Rolling Stones. And uh, we find out that some of these new uh, Latin type groups like um, and, and these, these K-pop groups like BTS and uh, Bad Bunny, they're all starting to probably get as big as Paul McCartney now. So, you know, things are looking good for us in, in this area. So anyway, let, let's sort of start from the beginning. And um, <clears throat> it was actually Einstein, of course, who theoretically predicted in a bunch of papers he published in 1916 that stimulate emission was possible in contrast spontaneous emission this is where photons could actually you know knock uh, electrons and higher energies down creating a similar photon so you could just be at a resonator you could have photons going back and forth and continually hitting 
energetic electrons to produce additional photon, uh, photons that are exactly in the same phase <laughs> and wavelength and energy as the original ones. So Charles Towns in 53, he, he was the first to conceive stimulated emission of microwave radiation. And he won a Nobel Prize in 1964 for that. And it wasn't long after that they're saying, well, you know, we can apply this to uh, radiation at, at, at much uh, higher wavelengths we go to visible light. And so 1960, not too far from when the actual Nobel Prize was awarded to Charles Towns, uh, Theodore Maiman, Maiman, he built the first um, laser using a synthetic ruby crystal. Of course, there's a, there's a direct band gap uh, structure that you see in most gemstones. And this was like the first solid state laser too, which was kind of interesting. It was pumped with a xenon lamp and it produced this, uh, this beautiful visible light at 694. It's a really nice deep red light. So we think we think the first use of lasers in entertainment was probably the film Goldfinger. And as you can see, Mr. Bond is ready to be bisected. He's apparently on a slab of gold that's being cut in half with a laser. Well, the story behind this shot is that a laser wasn't used because they well, probably one of the larger helium neons in at the time. Now, a large helium neon at that time was like 200 milliwatts, maybe. And they just could not see the beam with all the additional lighting you know, that was used to illuminate the actors. And so they had, they had to uh, you know, graph, put that in through graphics. So that, that was dubbed in. And if you actually watch the film, you see all these sparks that are coming out from underneath the slab, which is supposed to be the laser cutting it. Well, that's actually a guy with a welder's torch underneath producing the... Uh, the sparks that apparently making this this slot so that's how they did that so what they thought about using a laser but they couldn't so that was just dubbed in so anyway um so laser entertainment could be traced back to charles town's um uh, phd student at mit so Elsa Garmeyer got a doctorate at MIT under Charles Towns in nonlinear optics. I think she was looking, I think she was working on second harmonic generation. I'm not sure. Uh, so she went as a postdoc to uh, Caltech. And she, she was so fascinated by the, the actual light source and, and by you know its interaction with different media that she started a company called well, actually it was, a, it was a department, Experiments in Art and Technology. And uh, Elsa is attributed to coming up with one of the most famous um, effects that one can get from a laser beam. And that's called the Lumi effect, which I show here on the right-hand side. And uh, Elsa did that by putting Duco cement drop bubbles on glass. And if you shine laser on that, it will basically give you this kind of nice, uh, uh, you know, organic type behavior. And if you rotate it, if you actually rotate the glass, this thing moves in a very, very nice organic way. Uh, shower glass does the same thing. So if you take shower glass and take your little laser pointer, you can actually produce the same thing. So she's attributed to making the famous Lumi effect. Uh, so Elsa, she's given, um, you know, she's in, she, she goes to downtown Los Angeles. She sets her laser up at one of these art exhibits and she shows some of these diffraction patterns and these other effects, you know, in downtown Los Angeles at an art, art show. It was like actually an art show. And um, this guy, film, he's a filmmaker, Ivan Dreyer. He shows up. He was, he was uh, I, I believe he was UCLA filmmaker there, educated. He shows up and he sees these incredible, you know, visual displays of light that he's never seen before. So he was, he was working in an observatory at that time. And he said, geez, Let's 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 take your lasers and put them in an observatory. And he comes up with this thing called laserium. And so laserium is basically, um, you know, you're in an observatory, uh, you're showing constellations, and you're also projecting laser imagery as well. And and Dreyer always he said, look, it has to be done live. You just cannot record these images. You got to see the like the coherence and the speckle and all that associated with it. It just doesn't do it justice. So this, he was attributed to probably the first laser show um, known as Laserium. So they went to 46 cities and seen by over 20 million people. So th these are the two, uh, I guess, pioneers of bringing lasers into entertainment. And of course, Elsa Garmar comes right from the source, Charles Towns, which is kind of very interesting. So anyway, um, 
so here we go. We're 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 in the eighties, and we're trying to do laser shows. And and back then, um, and this is where I got this is where I got into the business here. Um, you only had ion lasers. I mean, you had to get like twenty watts, and the only thing you had really were ion lasers. Uh, this picture on the left hand side, this is a Spectrophysics 171 ion laser that probably most of you may have had in your lab. Um, you put 40,000 volt, 40,000 watts in, 20 watts out, typically. That head weighs 150 pounds. You have an exciter, which is basically 350 NPN uh, transistors all in banks of uh, uh, they're in parallel series combinations to get the current and voltage up across the anode of this thing. So here you're pumping uh, five pounds of water per minute through this thing. You need 480 volts, three phase, 70 amps per leg. And the DM thing is very fragile. So this is where we started with back then. And, um, and here's what our company did. This is the Seoul Olympic Games in September 1988. This was a seven head show. And you can just count up the lasers and you can say, well, how much power did you need to do that? Well, you need 280,000 watts of electricity to do that, not to mention 35 gallons of water per minute to do that. So it, it was hard and you charged a lot of money to do it, but it was such a unique light source. How else are you going to get it? So that's where we started from. It was, it was cruel. <laughs> it was tough. Um, so I just want to show you a picture of a typical uh, beam projector now remember you had you had one laser beam and it was it was very difficult to get that laser beam you needed a lot of energy and you need water cooling so you did a lot with one beam and so this thing's a typical projector very large bulky you slide the laser inside of this thing and you pick the beam off with these various um uh, flags and you can route it up into different effects like we have uh, a galvanometer which could do a two-dimensional scan beam turrets which could you know place beams in various places and then of course the, the famous lumia effect that you could project as well so everything was big back then um so in 1986 we did this um is an example of uh these are two argon lasers that are <clears throat> combined through uh, polarization and then we had to actually blow the beam up by a factor of 10 to get a divergence down. So, um, so Ronald Reagan is on Governor's Island. This is this is centennial of the Statue of Liberty when they just renovated it. And he's on Governor's uh, Island, which I guess is about a mile away from where the, uh, the statue is. And he had this great big fake switch button and he popped it and boom, beam goes across and hits the... Uh, it's Lady Liberty and she lights up with all these additional incandescent lights. So sort of an example of using big 20 watt argon lasers back in that time. So thank goodness technology has been good to us uh, over the years. Um, things got easier for us. Um, I, I show this, this is Stanford University. This is their tower. And it was the first demonstration of a, a 40 watt lamp pumped YAG laser. And in 1994, um, a company called LaserScope, uh, they were building YAG lasers uh, for doing uh, laser scalpel, laser uh, cauterization, for, for, for doing hospitals and for surgery. And they developed something for the entertainment industry. And what this was, it's a... Um, it's a Z-folded resonator. I don't know. Back then, um, you know, they had this thing called the green problem because, you know, you have infrared light and, uh, you know, your, your laser primarily lasers in 1064. And then you got to do a second harmonic generation process. So it's usually like KTP, potassium titanyl phosphate, which is like a little tiny oven. And then you had to get really, really high energy of infrared radiation on the surface of that KTP to get big efficiency of making green lights. So usually these were these were uh, Q switched, and so you had a couple kilowatts, you know, per pulse that went into these things. So this this is uh, this is the first demonstration of that for the uh, entertainment industry. And this this is like forty watts of green light, and this is five thirty two. So five hundred thirty two nanometers is at the spectrum of what's bright to your eye. So th this thing is see you can see this twenty thirty miles away, and so that was like a big big deal for us. Um, 
So we uh, we started with those, and so we had we had our ion lasers, which would give us uh, blue, uh, green, and krypton uh, red, and then we had the, these uh, these YAG lasers that came about. So um, not after we after they did YAG, um, you started getting companies like Coherent Radiation out in Mountain View. They built the optically pumped semiconductor laser, which they called OPSL. It's it's a band gap device, which is boutique, so they can change the actual uh, indium content, indium gallium arsenide to change the band gap, and then you can do second harmonic generation, and they can pretty much get any color of the rainbow out of a system like that. And we built our first lasers using uh, one of their modules for green. And of course, then we, uh, we have laser diodes now using primarily gallium nitride and uh, aluminum gallium indium phosphide. Now, the, the al um, Aluminum gallium indium phosphide is, is, is usually your red source, but the gallium nitride gives you the green and, and the blue. And, and, and of course, you can now get blue, which is like 440 nanometers and, and like four watts in a single uh, a, a package, nine millimeter package, which was a huge game changer. So anyway, so how do you make lasers now with, little, with, with individual laser diodes? You, you do something called beam stacking. And we started doing this probably in the early 2000s. And you get many laser diodes um, and you can stack them along what they call their fast axis, which is the axis, which is only single mode. And you can stack them that way. You make, a, um, you make a grid, you make a square beam and this thing get pretty big. And then you can actually defocus that down to hit the, um, you know, the mirrors on your galvanometers. And um, that's pretty much how all lasers are made now through um, beam stacking uh, laser diodes. So, so the YAG lasers and the ion lasers are, are just not used anymore. And here's a picture of our, uh, our first laser, first 25 watt laser uh, in 2009. And it sits in a 14 inch by 24 inch box. And it only takes 500 watts out of the wall. So it's really uh, <laughs> incredible change in efficiency. Um, this is um, this is one of these OPSLs. This is a coherent makes this. You get 10 watts out of this little guy and beam characteristics look pretty good. Uh, these are the red laser diodes. Uh, we had 36 that were combined at 200 milliwatts each. And then uh, the 1.6 watt laser diodes at blue sources. Now with Nichia, and Nichia first uh, Japanese company first made these these blue laser diodes out of the gallon. So they're for so Nakamura, Professor Nakamura, he's um he's a Santa, he's a professor at Santa Barbara. He came up, he won a Nobel Prize for the blue LED. So he's in Nichi at the time, and then he came up with the blue laser diode. So when we first saw this blue laser diode, we um they were they were twenty four hundred dollars each. So you know we're a small company trying to make it, and it's like oh my gosh, what the buy two of them and be really careful that we don't, you know, burn them out because they're they very fragile too. And I remember the guy from the Chia came and visited us. He goes, well, you know, why, why are you interested in our laser diets? I said, well, we're going to build lasers for entertainment. And then he disclosed to me, he said, you know, we have a customer making a video projector that uses our, our blue laser dyes. I said, oh, really? He says, yeah, they, um, they have 24 of our blue laser diodes in it. I said, huh? Really? 24? Like 2-4, 24. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He says, yeah, they use the blue laser diode for the blue light, but they also pump a phosphor to make green. And then they had a red LED, so they combined all these colors and they could get your RGB. I said, really? And then uh, he says, yeah, a customer called Casio. I said, really? So he, he left. I went straight to Best Buy and I bought every Casio projector they had on the shelf. And I remember opening up the back and there's like 24 of these laser diodes. I was paying 2,400 bucks each. So it was, it was huge. So we ended up, you know, buying many Casio projectors and taking the, the blue laser diodes out. That's, that was our source at that time. Now they're, now they're very cheap. Um, so fast forward today, th this is a hundred watt RGB laser. And this is what, this is usually, this is pretty much state of the art. Now this has uh, 31 watt, 520 nanometer laser dose. It's 30 watts of green in it. Uh, red sources, 500, uh, 60, 500 milliwatt um, red sources. There's about 30 watts of, um, of red. 
And then blue is uh, yeah, 12 three watt, you know, it's like 36 watts of 440. So you can combine these all together and you get this incredibly bright. So power is not a problem nowadays with this. Now, now, now I have to remark that the beam quality is not very good for these. I mean, the divergence is down. You can get the divergence down by basically uh, expanding the beam along its what they call the slow axis. So, but you know, the, it, it's it's not a laser you want to do spectroscopy with. Okay, so so here here's some examples of large scale projection that we did um, in, in in days past. So George Bush wanted his bat signal projected on. Uh, one of these skyscrapers right across the mass and square gardens. This is done with a 40 watt YAG laser here. Um, this is um, this is an animation we did in Baltimore. Ray Lewis, um, Baltimore Ravens, I believe we're going to the uh, playoffs at that time. So that's a 40 watt RGB laser doing that. So this, this thing is pretty, pretty big. And here's another example of um, large um, surface projection using lasers. This is the University of Baltimore downtown, and you can just have all these interesting uh, images scroll across. And you know, the contrast is great because it's a laser. You know, it's actually uh, at, at the time it's brighter than what a what a uh, video projector could do at that time. Of course, video projectors nowadays are laser-based as well. So that's an example of that. So this is um, typically what we did for the uh, NHL. This is the um, 2012 Stanley Cup Game 3. And um, yeah, these are these are lasers up in a catwalk uh, projecting uh, images down on the ice, which um, you know you see the contrast is, is is really well done. Now before before these are these are the solid state lasers that we built, but before that these were ion lasers, and um, I could I could tell you my horror stories of putting an ion laser up in a catwalk, and the water jacket breaks, and you start having water coming out of the catwalk hitting the ice, and the client was not very happy with that. So remember I told you about the, um, the Lumina effect that Elsa Garmeyer came up. So here, um, this, this is the uh, Kennedy Center for Performing Arts. And um, they had something back in 2013 called Nordic Cool. So they brought this, um, he was a lighting designer, I think from Scandinavia. And he says, uh, you know, to, ta to cap off the entire week of events of Nordic Cool, we wanted to project the Northern Lights around the uh, Kennedy Center for Performing Arts. So we, we did this with the, with the Illumina effect. Uh, I think we had 10 RGB lasers. And that's the Illumina effect here. And, and I don't know, it, you know, it's very difficult to project anything on a government building. And I just cannot tell you what we had to go through to get the, uh, you know, all, all the regulations and the, um, and all the upper powers to agree on that we could actually shine a laser you know, onto the Kenny Center for Performing Arts. And the same thing goes if you do something on the, on the Washington Monument or any other federal building, it, it's, it's a mountain of red tape to go through. But that's using a small, huge. Uh, and then um, I'd like to show you some effect we did. Now we did um, the Country Music Awards. Um, this is live. This is the band Perry. This kind of shows you how you can use lasers in a, in a, in a, in a musical performance. So these are the lasers we built. The solid state lasers up in the truss. I told you on the day we went, I was going to love you till I was dead. Made you wait till our wedding. That's the first and the last time I'll wear white. So time to find every do come loose. Time to spend a dollar. Let the stone say, Here lies a girl who's only crushed. Love and one day, just a little too much. If you go before I do, I'm gonna tell the grave digger that he better dig too. 
So we're going to talk a little bit about safety. Um, I got more to talk about safety in a little bit, um, but um, it is legal for performers to be hit with class four lasers, okay, provided they're, they're instructed exactly on how to, uh, where to stand and, and, and the dangers of it. You can never, you can never do this with general audience, but the F, the F, we are, we are regulated by the FDA with Center for Device and Radiological Health, and um, we can actually um, hit and have uh, performers interact with laser beams. And I got some other um, examples of that too. So here's America's Got Talent. We did them for a couple of years. And this is the first use of what we called our laser bars. These are, um, th these are individual sources that you could do some pretty interesting kinetic type of looks. I'll be your light, your match, your burning sun. I'll be the bright in black. That's making you run, and I think you thought so each one of these bars has 10 beams coming in of it. actually do these wave effects so um, you could do it by programming these things it's actually like a wave or a sine wave propagating across these arrays very epic type of look and then again you see these wave effects so you can't do that with any other kind of light it's it's got to be coherent it's got to be refracting off of some media of course you, know, you can't see laser beams unless they hit something. So, you know, there is a suspension that we put in every one of our, you know, when we do these things. Um, now, here's another, here's another example of um, using laser bars in, in a kinetic sculpture. Uh, these, these are RGB. This is the next generation of bar. And uh, here I'll show you that we made these, these cubes. And it's almost like a um, footprint of, of, of rooms uh, done with these uh, linear lasers. Of course, there's, there's one beam curiously missing right here, and that's where she walks through. Yeah, this thing looks pretty, pretty uh, interesting once you get uh, hundreds of beams like this. It's, Looking down. So yeah, America's got talent. They, you know, this is the finals, and that's when they spend a lot of money. So they say, you know, I don't care what it costs, just give me the most epic thing you've ever seen. And so we 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 really like it when we're working with people like that. They say we don't care what it costs, just give us something epic. Uh, one more one more example. Uh, this guy, uh, he's on a finalist for America's Got Talent. He's actually interacting with our laser beams in an interesting way. Um, he, 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 he sort of uh, puts his persona on like he's, he's some kind of mechanical man. To do Global Matrix, which I did in a very, very fast audition. So here is where we're instructing yeah, the uh, performer how to interact with the laser beam. Journey started from this performance. So it'd be great that I can finish with this same performance. Time to perform.
I don't know if he won, but he, he probably was a finalist. Um, okay, so he, here's something really cool, and it, it, it kind of ex, it kind of presents the kind of business we're in. Uh, Lady Gaga is uh, going on her uh, Joanne World Tour in 2017, and her her producers come up to us. She says, you know. Uh, Lady Gaga has like a new piano, like a unique piano for every one of her tours. And this year, she wants a piano that doesn't have real strings in it, but it has laser beams as strings. And uh, I said, uh, yeah, we're, <laughs> he came to the right guys. And they say, yeah, we, we need it in six weeks. I said, oh, geez. So um, here, here's sort of like the concept. Um, and we had 44... RGB laser sources in here, they're three watts each. Uh, each one sort of simulated a string that came through, I mean, a little more than three octaves of, of laser light uh, strings, if you think about it. And at the end of um, the actual sounding board, we had an actuator, which would take the beam and project it up. And um, so here, here's Lady Gaga playing the piano. As you can see, all these, uh, these are actual laser beams coming out. And um, and then she could actually flip a button and then it could come out of the back like this, which, which is really epic. It's, it's like a real, real long projection all the way to the st top of the, uh, the arena. And what we were able to do is uh, she's playing, of course, an electronic keyboard because there's no real keyboard there. And we're taking the MIDI, which is a um, it's a protocol for actually uh, musical devices and then taking the MIDI and controlling our laser sources with it. And uh, so this is the Lady Gaga. If you ever want to, you can go on YouTube and you can actually see this thing um, yeah, on, on some of the YouTube videos. But, you know, we're given six weeks to do this from concept to reality. So um, one thing I miss about NIST, you know, NIST is like, well, we're going to try this experiment and maybe quarter one we'll think about it. Quarter two we'll actually do it. And, you know, we unfortunately got a null, null, a null um, event or null effect. And not in this business, you can't have a null effect. <laughs> It's got, it's got to work. So this is the Trans-Siberian Orchestra. I don't know if you've ever seen these guys. Um, these, um, these guys play Christmas music. And so they, they go all, they have three tours. Uh, they go through the United States and um, we pretty much build all the lasers for them. And we build all the fire effects for them too. And I'll just show you a clip of, of the, what, what their show looks like. I mean, they got lots of effects, so they just do it. Uh, flaming isopropyl alcohol, 99%, which you see being injected out of a, of a, of a AV. Actually, actually, we found out that, that um, you know, uh, spray systems you use like um, high pressure spray systems, you use like to wash your house. You can use those to uh, make very, very good uh, uh, ejectors of injecting isopropyl alcohol and catching it on fire, and you get like 60 feet of flame from that. So, a uh, lot, lots of fun here. Um, so another thing is that I'd like to show you where you can combine lasers, video mapping, pyrotechnics, flame effects, and even snow machines to create these, these very, very large type of, um, you know, um, uh, shows with special effects. And, and here's, we used to do this in Baltimore. This is Baltimore. They have a, um, uh, an old power plant building, which was actually the power plant building that ran the streetcars in Baltimore. And they redone it. I think they put a Barnes and Noble and some other shops in there. And um, they asked us a number of years ago to actually do a, a large show on this. And I'll show you some uh, features of that show. <laughs> So these 
these are laser projections that are actually ending up in terminating on buildings. We cannot do anything that um, that's not unterminated. FAA is um, they get very irritated if you put unterminated laser beams out. And uh, there's a whole nother story behind that. So we try to avoid that. We can do it, but it takes a lot of uh, calculations. Um, you have to convince them you're nowhere near airports. If you do scan an aircraft, it's below 50 nanowatts per centimeter squared, which means it doesn't even dazzle the pilots. So the pilots cannot even be dazzled. I mean, they're not even worried about eye injury. They're worried about being dazzled or something of that effect. So these are all terminated on buildings here. We used to do a, um, a show on the beach in Ocean City every year, too. And this features a 50-foot diameter sphere that was a cold air inflatable. And we projected on that as well. Here's us setting this thing up. The 40 watt RGB, one of my first that I built for that power. business um they take metrics right they um they if you do a couple of shows like this they uh they give questionnaires to all the people on the boardwalk and all the little businesses and they say how much stuff did you sell did your business go up did you see more traffic and so you know we being invited back for a year after this for the following year all is basically based on those metrics so you know it's got to make money it's got to make money for somebody so uh that's that's the pro that's the that's the unfortunate thing about being in this business. You gotta make money, but nevertheless, all businesses gotta make money, I guess. So anyway, um, this is the largest laser show in the world. We briefly held the Guinness Book of World Records for the largest laser show. This is um the Staples Center in Los Angeles. Um, we had probably close to 900 individual laser sources there. And um so we had, uh, you know, many of these fixtures, these bar fixtures hanging up that were scanning. Um, we had bigger lasers, which are in the, hiding in the grid work here and in the truss work. And so, you know, it was I think I think we held this for like three months and somebody beat us. So, but that's what happened. When you have infinite amount of laser power, this is something you can do. Uh, one thing I want to show you that. Um, you know, we have we have lots of software tools to help us visualize uh, what we're going to do before we give it to a client. And uh, so there, there, there's this guy called Drake, and he's like a he's like a kind of a, a big rock star kind of rapper guy. And this is something we prepared for him, which sort of shows um, audiences uh, in in being scanned with lasers. We're going to talk about audience scanning in a minute. But you can pretty much visualize exactly the kind of looks. Uh, you're going to do to show the uh, the client, and you can put the entire model of the venue in there, so you can you know, can get it to look exactly what it should look like when in in, in reality. And there's our performer right in the middle there.
So another thing I want to show you is that, you know, my brothers and I would, you know, we, we would sort of kid saying, you know, our business is good when the economy's bad. It's good when the economy's good. But what could really kill us was a pandemic where we couldn't have people, you know, get in large groups to, to see our work. And so we did, we did a lot of things that were virtual uh, with lasers. And I'm going to show you something uh, that's it's impossible to do. Uh, in the real, you know, with the physics on this planet as I understand it, but you can do it in the virtual world. I'm going to show you what we can do with these beams by um, taking the video sync of a camera and tying it into our laser scanning galvanometers. And you can, you can make actual laser radiation stop in mid-space. I'm going to show you an example of this. So here's this guy, Cascade. See how these lasers just sort of stop? So these effects here, you cannot do them in real life. And uh, that's because of the sync game we're playing with the camera, stopping this stuff. So the danger of doing this stuff is that, um, you know, a, a client will look at this and say, I, that's what I want. I want you to do that on my stage. And you have to explain to the client, no, you, you can't do this in real life. You can only do it like in a virtual world where you're, 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 you're filming this on a camera and, you know, it, it, it's, so you gotta be careful what you show people, even if it's like, you know, it's like, it's like Hollywood, right? It's like, I thought everything's possible if it's on television. No, it, it's not, it's made up. So All right, let's talk about audience scanning. Um, audience scanning is uh, the ability to actually, you can scan uh, lasers right into uh, the eyes of people, provide as class one. And what is class one? Class one laser light is like the class of laser light you use to scan your uh, UPC symbol at, at the local supermarket. That's class one. Class one, you can look at that laser light for pretty much, um, you can look at it forever and it, it will not, it will not form a, a, an eye injury of any type. Uh, and, you know, the federal government jumped into this, studying this about the time lasers were being used industrially and they, they came out and they said, look, this is what we're going to do. We're going to take these samples of retinal tissue and we're going to take different levels of irradiance, okay, watts per centimeter squared, and we're going to take, say, 10 samples and we're going to irradiate these things with this irradiance from laser light. And then they're going to look under a microscope and they're going to say, well, do, I, do we see any changes in any of our 10, 10 samples? So if they saw five changes, and, and, and the changes are not really defined. It, what is it? What is a change? Is it a change a lesion? Is it a burn mark? Is it dis, you know, a disorganization of the cells? What is it? They said, well, we just say, you know, we, we looked at 10 samples. We saw five that, that looked different from before. And they said, okay, you take the irradiance level that was used to induce that experiment and divide it by 10. And they call that the maximum permissible exposure limit, MPE. MPE is a function of exposure time. So the amount of joules or the amount of watts per centimeter square that you can put into your eye is a function of the exposure time. So the faster, the, the, the smaller the exposure time, uh, as that decreases, you can put more watts per centimeter squared in your eye. And that's how we do audience scanning. So audience scanning is, so if our scanners are scanning one millisecond, which means that they're scanning a laser back and forth. It takes one millisecond for it to get from one end of your pupil to the other end of your pupil. Um, you can basically calculate uh, what the irradiance is going to be. So I'm going to show you some, some of our um, 
um, our products that exist that use uh, this this audience scanning. So here's um, here's five lasers with scanners. Uh, they're they're scanning at about you know the, it's like five radians per second. So it's like a millisecond um, exposure time across the retina. There's special electronics in here that will shut this thing off within. 100 microseconds or less if the scanner stops. So the can't, scanner cannot stop. And so that's one example. Another example is, um, let me turn that off. So we took this a step further. You can use a polygon. A polygon spins a lot faster than a, a galvanometer. So a galvanometer, you know, maybe 100 microseconds, you can uh, scan a beam back and forth with a polygon. Uh, you can get below six microseconds or even four microseconds if you're like like 10 to 20,000 RPM. So we came up with a, a device that um, we also have a um, um, a variance to use this in, in the public. And uh, I'll show you an example of this here. So this is a polygon. Feeding a polygon is a 20 watt laser, but since it's scanning so fast, is class one. That's our that's our light vector bars. And that's the polygon. So you can do you can do some interesting effects with it. I mean it's like sort of like a one-trick pony, but you can actually modulate the colors if you uh, know when the scan stops and starts. And then here is, um, here, here's like a reveal type of an effect that one can do like with a tunnel with uh, three of these units. And I believe these are doing about 10,000 RPM, these, these, these polygons. And that's, that's 20 watts of uh, 20 watt laser feeding these things. And so that's like a reveal. Okay, one thing I wanted to show you since we're talking about laser safety, um, you know, you don't want to have an accident in this business. Okay, so if an accident, if, you, if someone has an accident in this business, we all suffer. Uh, this was Moscow, Russia, 2008, uh, called the Aqu Aquamarine Festival. And they had this outdoor festival and they had lasers there. They had neodymium pulsed YAG lasers, which are very dangerous. Okay, because remember, they had the Q switch to get the, get the efficiency up. You have several kilowatts uh, of, of energy per pulse in these things. So starts to rain. They take the lasers, they put them inside into a tent, and then they actually take the lasers and they start scanning the people with it. And this is from a broadcast in, uh, in Russia. I don't know what these people are saying, but... So these... these these photographs are actually taken by kids with their cameras, their images on their phones. And you immediately see there's a scan, a horizontal scan circuitry, which has been destroyed. I mean, the laser lights got in there and destroyed this imager. So some of these guys actually experienced, um, you know, eye injuries. Uh, some were permanent, others were not permanent, from what I understand. Ну и такое ощущение, как будто вот на солнце очень яркий свет что-то посмотрел, то есть вижу плох, сразу одел очки, постоял, постоял, думаю, пойду схожу к бару, вот дошел до бара, 20 минут уже лица барменов я не вижу. Дима пробовал снимать все на фотоаппарат, и вот что получилось. Лазерный луч на мгновение попал в объектив, и все, матрица фотоаппарата испортилась окончательно. А вот другая съемка ночью, и тот же эффект, как только излучение попадает на камеру мобильного телефона, на экране сразу возникают дефекты изображения. А что говорить о сетчатке глаза? Она еще более чувствительна к свету, чем матрица видеокамеры. So you can imagine what's happening in these guys when you their eyes um, and is destroying their imager. So, you know, when this happened, you know, CNN came right up to our door and knocked on it and said, you guys do laser shows, right? How do you, you know, you, you heard about this thing in Moscow. I said, yeah, I know, it, but it's Moscow. It's not the United States. You want to have the Center for Device and Radiological Health, you know, health, health there. And so it took a lot of backpedaling to, to kind of explain to uh, you know, the press why this thing probably could never happen in the United States. 
Um, so I'm, I'm going to finish up here and talk about some drone shows. I don't know. Have you all seen drone shows? Most of you? Well, um, perhaps we think drone shows were probably inspired by a TED talk given by uh, University of uh, Pennsylvania professor, Professor VJ Kumar, where he had, um, you know, he had drones that were participating with each other and they could, they could, they could actually you know, navigate uh, small orifices and fly in formation and some other things. So uh, a technology developed called uh, RTK, real-time kinetic GPS, and you can get an accuracy of about one centimeter. So you can put a drone within one centimeter of each other. Uh, we have a drone um, fleet. We have 200 aircraft. Uh, we have to have FAA certified pilot on site. And, uh, and of course, many shows are starting to, uh, many show companies are sprouting up now. And, 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 and drones is a pretty good alternative to fireworks, if you think about it, because fireworks, and, and Disney is starting to think about this. They're saying, you know, our fireworks are the fallout and the pollution and the perchlorates and all the other stuff you make fireworks is starting to pollute our, um, our lakes and streams around here. So the fallout can be, you know, it, it's, 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 it's poisonous. You know, another thing is that with droughts and other things, um, you know, you, you, you don't want to do fireworks where you have a drought situation, it's a fire hazard. So a lot, a lot of people are thinking about drone shows now. So it's come, come to the point where, um, you know, you have, there's open source design software. So if you want to, you know, come up with your own drone show, you buy your drones and you have open source software, which actually uh, places them in space relative to each other. Um, I don't know if you've seen this on, um, YouTube, but the Guinness Book of World Records has 5,000 drone show in 2021 in China. It's just absolutely amazing seeing this thing. So let me let me show you one of our drone shows here real quick. This was the uh, this was done over Kansas City, Missouri for the Chiefs, and this is part of the NFL playoffs in 2021. Oops, get back here, right here. So I do have a story about a drone show we tried to do last week in Norfolk, Virginia, and uh, we were supposed to fly it on a Saturday night, and um, we hooked everything up, and um, we went down there like a week before, flew one drone. Okay, fine, works. One drone works. But uh, everybody shows up to see the drone show, and you got all these ships and boats that show up, they're all running their radar, you know, had navigation radar on. Uh, we also set up... Um, the drones were said the only available place was a uh, parking garage top, which had lots of uh, rebar and some other metals in it. And um, we couldn't control the drones at all. It, it's like there was so much interference, either for the navigational radars or through, you know, what's going on um, in this rebar and these other metal structures, we couldn't fly. It, it just could not get control of this stuff. So we, uh, we had to scratch it. Client wasn't very happy, and then we moved it to the next evening, Sunday night, but we had to move the entire drone show over to another location where it wasn't interference. So electromagnetic interference is, is a bit of a difficulty with these things, because remember, they're, they're moving fast. They're making very, very quick calculations, and you can't have you know, a hiccup. In, in the um, in, in the, the RTK um, you know calculations that are going on in full you know real time so 
So anyway, what, what do we look for in the future? Um, <clears throat> so lasers are ubiquitous. They're everywhere now. In entertainment touring technology got us there. So the idea is how to, uh, how to do something creative with it now that hasn't been done before. Uh, all, laser augmented movie theaters are probably going to be around soon. Uh, laser, there's actually lasers in cinema projectors. Most of, them, most of them, your high-end cinema projectors are laser-based. It gives you an incredible chromaticity. It gives you a very incredible brightness that you can't get from a xenon lamp. Um, we're going to continue seeing um, large-scale volumetric displays, probably using mixed technologies like drones, video projection, pyrotechnics, and lasers. Uh, they have a, a, a screen technology called carbon black. And what it is, it's a bunch of jumbled up nanotubes. So they, 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 they grow nanotubes and they make a big fabric out of it. And there's different diameters. And so they resonate at different wavelengths. And so if you shine light on one of these, these carbon black, carbon nanotube type screens, it, it's almost like, it almost like emits light. It's like a resonance going on. It's like, oh my God, that's brighter. It's not just reflecting the light. It, there, there's, there's, there's light generation or something going on in, inside of it. And uh, I don't have any examples of that, but that's a technology that's coming around. Uh, one thing we're looking at now is uh, using um, lasers to stimulate phosphors to make extremely bright, bright lights. And um, so we're working with... Um, I mentioned uh, Suji Nakamura. He's got a company out in uh, California called Kyocera SDL Laser, and he makes a little tiny chip. It's seven by seven millimeter. It's two uh, blue lasers, which are uh, configured to pump a phosphor. And the phosphor dot is only 600 microns on the side. So it's really small, uh, but it does produce about a thousand lumens. And uh, I have an example of this here. Here's, um, I tiled I, nine of them together. This is my, my garage. And this is, this, is, this is equivalent to a xenon lamp. And it's only drawing probably 300 watts out of the wall. And that's one of these stimulated uh, phosphors. So we, we, um, we're working aggressively in that area too. So, um, so you know, lasers maybe are, not going to be the sole source of light, but they can actually produce light by pumping other things. Um, and that's pretty much it, guys, unless you have questions or anything. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I enjoyed this very much, but uh, uh, many years ago, I gave a demonstration of a uh, simulated underwater sound and uh, you know it worked very well but one of the directors of the lab commented you know criticized it said you're having too much fun <laughs> well I, I think you're having too much fun and the question is how do you respond to that criticism guilty as charged I mean <laughs> It's it's entirely too much fun. It's uh like I say, it, it, I'm I'm in this business with my brothers, okay, and, and you know God bless my brothers. They they know how to run a business. They know they know how to make money with this. And it's like you know, I, it's the least thing I want to do is figure out, you know, how to make. Well, it's nice to make money. You have to make money to continue. But what's nice about this is that um, I think my NIST experience work, working with those really top of the line people have given me so much exposure to things that um you know people in in these special effect companies have, have they have they don't have that kind of exposure and so you know i really have to attribute to my my background with my colleagues at nist and, and just just the being exposed to you know these technologies and other things that yeah, now, now we're to the point where we can exploit it and, and actually make something. So you're right. I'm guilty as charged. I'm, I'm having way too much fun. Well, we had a lot of fun listening to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I really, really like talking about this stuff. Well, one comment about you having fun, that there were years where you were uh, struggling you know, it wasn't all roses. Well, you mean at NIST, of course. Well, I mean, with, with your company too, getting Oh, yeah, yeah, 
Yeah, I mean, it. you know, the, the thing about it was, it was like having two jobs. It's like, um, you know, I, you can imagine, it's like, you know, it's, it's like I leave NIST and I had a really nice, great career at NIST, but uh, you leave NIST and you come home and you, you start working on this stuff. But it's like, you know, come on guys, it's, it, this ain't worked us. It's just like, you know, we live for this stuff, right? Bob has a question. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, I noticed it seems like everything you do here, uh, the medium is just plain air. Yes. And I was wondering if like on a show inside someplace that you do anything or tried modifying the air somehow to give special effects. Yes. Um, we outdoor um, shows, we rely on particulate stuff in the air like moisture and water vapor. Um, you know, lately with the smoke from Canada, it'd be really good to do laser shows nowadays <laughs> around here. <laughs> uh, so we rely on that. Um, now where we would have problems outdoor, this is before I'm not gonna I'm gonna talk about the indoor stuff in a minute. Um you um you it'd be really difficult to do this up in Colorado in a ski resort where where your humidity is like 30%. It'd, it'd be very difficult. There's hardly anything in the air. And and you know, we've tried stuff like that, you just can't see anything. Uh, so inside, there, there's a whole bunch of hazer fog technology that, that you know, you can generate um, uh, residual free, um, you know, uh, residual free liquids uh, that you can um, atomize and put up into the, um, you know, into the atmosphere and have the Raleigh diffraction that you're, you're betting on that's going to show you the volumetric effects of laser beams. Um, now, there are cases where we're at the Folger Shakespeare Library in Baltimore. They want a laser show and they're saying, no, no, you can't use any kind of haze or fog. We've got these very expensive tapestries on the wall. You cannot use anything like that. And I said, oh, shoot, what are we going to do? So I walk up to one of these tapestries and I start shaking it and all this dust came off of it. And it produced such a great cloud to project lasers through. They love they, they love it. They say, how'd you do this? I said, oh, well, you know, it's just dust floating around in here. <laughs> so so anyway, yeah, you have to make do with what you have. But in almost every case, uh, you have either a hazer or some kind of fog machine. But they're all water-based now. They used to be, um, you know, they used to be um, refined uh, vegetable oil-based, but now they're all water-based. So they don't leave no residue. And so... That's would, it be, would it be possible to do it like underwater, like in an aquarium? You could. Oh, yeah. Yep, you could. We, we, you know, I, I'm sure you've seen examples like that uh, where, uh, you know, lasers are uh, being projected underwater. Um, no, I mean, I, I've seen that. I've seen this like in, um, in big tanks and things like that. So, uh, yeah, definitely, definitely any kind of media that you can have this Raleigh diffraction where you can have photons hitting something and scattering off will work. Thank you. John, uh, did you have to do any uh, atmospheric modification for uh, shining that laser beam at the Statue of Liberty? No, absolutely not. That, no. So the, the, the air was uh, had enough impurities in it to scatter the light? Absolutely. Absolutely. It, 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 look, it looked as... Now that... <clears throat> To be fair with you guys, that's a little bit overexposed. Okay, that's, that's a little bit overexposed, so it looks a little bit brighter than it was, but it was bright enough that everybody saw, hey, there's a laser beam coming out hitting that, that Statue of Liberty. So it was a little bit exposed. Picture looks better that way. Many years ago, I um, attended a, a celebration, um, 50th anniversary, I think, of something, and uh, they had uh, atomizers at the top of a door and a doorway and uh, you get a, a mist coming down and they managed to do some interesting laser effects off of that mist. Oh, so it, cool. was it was contained in, uh, and not damaging anything. Right, right. Um, there, there are some technologies that people are working in is how, how do you confine fog or haze in, into a 3D space? So you could, you know, the, the holy grail of all this is to, to make a 3D projection. 
you know, in space anywhere you want. So, you know, the photons have to stop somewhere, as you can see it. And there are some interesting ideas of how to manipulate and control fog sources and haze sources. So it's, it's confined in a, in a, in a three-dimensional area, but it really gets hard to do that in a, in a practical environment when you have air handling and other things. So it's just, it's just too many factors to control. If there are no more questions, uh, we thank you, uh, John, for a very entertaining uh, talk. Um, a couple questions. Um, it's it's been recorded. Do you have any uh, 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 problem with it being posted? Uh, probably not. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's. I don't think I've shown you anything that's. Uh... Okay, the, you want to take your stop sharing off the screen? I will do that. <laughs> there you go. Oh. Hey. Very good. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Appreciate Thank it. You. Thank okay. you. Okay. Going to end the, the whole presentation. Thank you all for coming. And remember, we're always looking for speakers and we're looking for people to uh, participate on the planning committee. So, okay. yeah. May I make some suggestions in that line? Can you ask for um, uh, what is the title, abstract, and bio for people who wanted to give speeches? And I would suggest that we make that so that our uh, each of the uh, uh, top list of uh, potential speakers has a, uh, a tab that we can look at and. Uh, and they can update it at any time and anybody can give more than one tab. And, uh, and then it's a question of when that speech would be given, not uh, what it's about. And of course okay. they can change it at any time. Okay, can you bring that up at our planning committee? Well, I will try. Okay. <laughs> but we won't have a planning committee meeting until August. August, yes. Uh, we have a bit of a hiatus. Yes. And our, our okay. speaker, uh, well, our, our speaker should know we're having a tour of the National Cryptological uh, Museum in August. Yeah, I think. What is that? Uh, uh, flash that on the 16th of August? Yes. I'm looking it up. I don't know. It's on the third Wednesday? Yes, 16th. 16th. Okay. Uh, we'll, Again, those we'll are have, open. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll have uh, announcements sent out um, sometime earlier in August, and uh, we'll have announcements sent out uh, probably in uh, late July to uh, uh, take uh, participate in uh, the uh, planning. Committee. And the, so, we will have a planning committee meeting on the first Thursday in August. Is that right? Yeah, I, I, I think so. I mean, it, it, uh, it is in July. There will be an that's announcement the, for that too. And that's anyway, the third of August. I'm sorry, what was that last? The third of August? Third of August. Okay. Okay, with, with that, I'll bid you all adieu. Thank you. Take care, guys. Real pleasure.